Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be back after a week away. Um, my aunt and uncle celebrated their 70th wedding anniversary and we had a great open house and then a family dinner at the restaurant afterward and I think they really enjoyed the day so I was glad to go and see some of my cousins that I hadn't seen for a long time too. Announcements are found on the back of your bulletin and on the screen. Uh, tomorrow night we sing at the Varney Crossing Nursing Home and I'm going to try to remember this time, I forgot last time. But, uh, Thursday the Lenten study continues on Simon Peter. Next Sunday's sermon and the sermon series is Hearts of Stone. I know that there are some heart-shaped stones out there. If anyone has a heart-shaped stone they'd like to bring, that would be fine. Maybe we can make a display on the altar or something. Uh, and then after worship next Sunday is an SPRC meeting. Are there other announcements? Yes, Cheryl. Uh, dress a girl next Monday. Not, the, not tomorrow. I don't. The April 1st? Actually, I think it's Monday. Actually, I thought it was supposed to be tomorrow. I wasn't the only. All right. It, it was, was March 25th. You had it on the Monday of the week I left. And then the following Monday you didn't, so it would be tomorrow, wouldn't it? Okay. So tomorrow we'll have Dress a Girl Sewing. Any other announcements? Then let us begin our worship by singing Lord Speak to Me, number 463, and on the screen. Jesus, our Savior. Amen. 
Our first scripture reading is from Romans chapters 14, verses 1 through 10. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating everything, while the eat weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before our, their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld. For the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we, we die, we are the Lord's. So to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or... You, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. May God bless this reading from the book of Romans. Will the children please come forward for the children's time? Um, there's it's a playground chant that they, would, they used to say when I was a kid, you know. 
So he would say, you know, physically we're not hurt when people say bad things, but emotionally we're hurt a lot. It's a form of bullying when people say bad things to us. Just like the rudder and, your, and the bit in the horse, your tongue and the words you say can steer you in different directions. If you say unkind words, your life will go in one direction. If you say kind words, your life will go in another way. Okay? And who controls the tongue? We do. We do. And it's likely that we'll still say bad things or things that hurt other people, sometimes unintentionally. I hope you never say things like that on purpose. But sometimes we do say things that we wish we hadn't said in a fit of anger or emotion or whatever. So I hope that we'll ask God to help us say encouraging things to people and not harmful things to people. But let us pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us the ability to speak using only our little tongues to form words. Help us to use kind, encouraging words rather than unkind or hurtful ones. We want you to be in charge of our words and to guide us in the right way. And this we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may go back to, uh, go to Sunday school, right?
Our scripture reading this morning from the Gospel is from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. And I want to share a little bit about this passage before I begin, because this particular story in the Gospel of John does not appear in the principal Eastern manuscripts of the book. It's not found in any of the ancient Coptic manuscripts, and that is the reason that the Revised Standard Version sometimes does not include it in the text, but as a footnote. And some manuscripts even place this text in Luke's Gospel, following Luke 21, 38. And some include it in other places in the Gospel of John. It is found in Western manuscripts. Jerome included it in the Latin translation of it, but it is not in the original Greek. It appears in one of the best 5th century manuscripts. So it's an interesting uh, background to this story here. When each of them went home and while Jesus came, while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and then early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. May be seated. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. As I said to the children, that little rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never harm me. We know from experience that this playground chant is not true, because words can hurt. Criticism can hurt us deeply. Yet we tell our children otherwise whenever the other kids are being cruel. Just ignore them, we say, or don't pay any attention to what the others say. Remember, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words can never harm you. But we know it's not true. Someone once wrote a more accurate idiom that goes this way. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can stick like anything. And we know that's true, too. For example, a teenage girl walks by a group of ninth grade boys, and one of them whispers in an audible voice, Hey, Molly's getting a little chunky, don't you think? Oink, oink. And of course, Molly laughs out loud as she hurries by, and then she heads off to the nearest restroom and bursts into tears. In the future, she'll pay countless visits to that restroom, but now it's to purge and vomit the salad and rice cake she just ate in the school cafeteria. We know it happens. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can stick like anything. Words can hurt worse and have more debilitating sounds than, or wounds than a stick or a stone. Whether the words target a child or a spouse or a friend, the effects of cruel words can be devastating. In today's society, cruel words, bullying words, have increased through cyberbullying. 
Cyberbullying can happen in an email, a text message, a game, or on a social networking site. It might involve spreading rumors or images posted on someone's profile or passed around for others to see, creating a, a group or page to make a person feel left out and has caused even more pain and has caused teenagers to take their own life. Teenage suicide is on the increase in the last decade. It's almost doubled since the cyberbullying became prevalent. And the writer of James, as I told the children, knew the harm of words. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The late Pastor Mark Durstead, former president of Good Samaritan Society, also once remarked that the tongue is the most powerful muscle in the human body. It weighs only a quarter pound, he said, but in a single moment it can destroy a person's reputation or demolish their sense of self-worth. And it's been that way for years. The way it works is very simple. I know something wrong that you have done, and now whenever I look at you, I see you through the lens of that mistake. It doesn't matter whether it's true or not. What matters is that once some people know something about you, or think they think something is true about you, they will never let go of it. It's always in the back of their mind. And we, therefore, we hide our sins, our mistakes, because we know if they are not hidden, they will be held against us. It is why so many people move away from where they are known. People do, who do not know them cannot hold them in their sin. Negative gossip. It is hard to resist. I've heard that Jack once, or apparently Sally used to, and so it goes. It passes the time. It is flattering to the ego to know something about someone else. And at least you're better than that pathetic mess you just put on the, under the microscope of public scrutiny. There is a scene in the movie Steel Magnolias where one of the characters says, if you can't say anything good about anybody, you just come right over here and sit next to me. Holding people in sin is the perfect accompaniment, accompaniment to lunch until it is you who are held. And that brings us to the gospel story today, the woman caught in adultery. The story begins when Jesus was teaching early one morning in the synagogue and the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught committing adultery, and made her stand before all of them. Can you imagine someone bringing in a woman to this church and making her stand in front of all of us after she'd been caught? The scribes and the Pharisees are doing what they do best, catching and surrounding and staring at and holding that special gift of self-righteousness, and they are so good at it. The sin sticks. Ask anybody who has been made to stand there in front of everybody. <coughs> However, there are some people who hold people in their sin for a living. They think of nothing else and they are single-minded about it. How can I use this about him or her to get something on him, to get what I want? So the Pharisees stood her in plain sight of everyone and said, Teacher, this woman was caught red-handed sleeping with a man who was not her husband. In the law, Moses gave order that such a woman should be stoned to death. What do you say? A woman such as this, or such a woman, the label must have stung as it landed on her ears. But in case she missed the charge, the onlookers probably poured on the, the evidence. She's an adulterer. We say stone her to death. Notice, there's no mention of the man, which is unequal uh, judgment there on my part, I think. But there's more than one way to stone someone. In fact, they didn't even need to stone her. I imagine she was already dying a slow and painful death there 
in the temple, in front of her community, and in the presence of Jesus. Words, sharp, painful words, stabbing her in the heart. It's been said that religious people are the only army who ever shoot their wounded. And that's what's unfolding here. Several hands picked up their stones of judgment. Several pairs of eyes looked upon the woman such as this. But one pair of eyes refused to stare. Jesus looked down at the ground and began writing in the dirt. When they persisted in asking questions, he stood up straight and replied, Whoever among you is guiltless may be the first to throw the stone at her. Then he bent over again and wrote on the ground. He refused to add to the woman's humiliation. Jesus refused to condemn her, even though he was the only one gathered who was qualified to do so. In other words, Jesus was saying to those self-righteous Pharisees so ready to condemn the woman, if you are perfect, if your life's without sin, you can start the stoning. I think it's no accident that the older Pharisees were the first to leave. As we age, it seems we become more aware of our own shortcomings and more honest about our own failures. Pretty soon, even the youngest, most zealous Pharisees had dropped their stones at Jesus' feet and left the temple. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And now was the time when he could judge her. And he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, sir. Neither do I, said Jesus. Go on your way. From now on, don't sin. According to the rules, the woman deserved to die. To die. But this time, compassion won out. This time, love was more powerful than justice. Jesus, the one who refuses to hold people in their sins, reminds her of her dignity and life-giving power. Judgment is nowhere to be found, only mercy. Now, I think it's important to make a distinction here, though, about judgment. Pastor James McCormick writes, as Christians, we are to make moral decisions, distinctions, but never from the position of self-righteousness. We may identify someone's behavior as unacceptable or sinful, but we must never assume that we are better than they are. The sinful behavior we see in another person may not be our particular problem, but we have sins of our own which will do just fine to keep us from any sense of moral superiority. So it's important to make moral decisions about what is right and what is wrong and to try our best to, to refrain from doing them. But for people who fail, we shouldn't feel a sense of superiority and self-righteousness. 2,000 years after the fact of this story, we readily admit that Jesus was right and the woman deserved a second chance. And yet we are so harshly critical of people just like her in our day, people who make mistakes and break the rules. We can absolve her of century-old indiscretions, but we condemn the 21st century sinners. Just think of the news reports you hear about politicians and, and Hollywood stars and singers. We resent the actions of the Pharisees in Jesus' day, but we have carried on the tradition of judgment and scorn and punishment for those who get caught sinning today. We hold them in their sin loaded with stones or words or attitudes of self-righteousness, we are eager to throw the first stone. And there is another way, and Lent is a good time to consider it. 
Robert Schuller was invited to an African-American church in the deep south to observe the anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. When he stood up to preach to a sea of black faces, Schuller was overcome with emotion. Here were the great-grandsons and great-granddaughters of slaves, many of whom had been humiliated and abused. Though he tried to speak, the words would not come, and Schuller spent several minutes at the pulpit, weeping. Finally, the host pastor joined Dr. Schuller at the podium, he himself now crying. And the African-American pastor put his arm around the white pit preacher and said, Dr. Schuller, in this church, no one weeps alone. That is compassion. That is tenderness. And that is the gospel. The question I pose this morning is who do you identify with most in this story? Are you going through life with self-righteously clenched fists, one clenching an accusing point and the other a rock? It may not be a literal stone, but it may be a rock of slander, a rock of innuendo, a rock of disapproval. If so, it is time to repent of your self-righteousness. Stop looking at others and look in the mirror. It's time for you to deal with your sin. For all of us have sinned and fallen short. Or perhaps you feel like the woman. Everywhere you go, you feel the stares or sense everyone whispering about you. You know you have made mistakes. You wish you could go back and make some decision differently. If this is you, I remind you that there is one who is more concerned about restoring your life than taking it. There is one more concerned about healing than increasing your pain, and his name is Jesus. Turn to him. He knows what you have done, and he will forgive you and set you free if you will but turn to him. I would guess that all of us at one time or another have really messed up and needed a second chance to start over. We're looking for the kind of place described by Louise Fletcher Tarkington. She writes, I wish that there were some wonderful place in the land of beginning again where all our mistakes and all our heartaches could be dropped like a shabby old coat at the door and never put on again. The truth is there is a place just like that and we are here in it. Every time we gather for worship we are reminded that this is a land of beginning again. This is a place to do over and, and second chances through the forgiveness offered to us by Christ our Savior. The stone you hold this morning, I'll find my stone, both real and imagined, has perhaps already been targeted for someone. I'll just remember, I'm just remembering on the flight to Indianapolis last week, there was a man I sat beside and he told me he hated his ex-wife. That was his stone. Perhaps the stone represents the mistakes you have made. Those who have never sinned here may take your stone with you. The rest of us are invited to lay them at the foot of the cross and be given a second chance to begin again. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.
let us join in the prayer of special. We are sinful people, O Lord, but we disguise ourselves to look righteous by condemning others who are obvious sinners. Forgive us when we have been overcome with a piety that drives the sinners out from our circle of friends without any interest to drive out the sin from our own behavior. Grant us your grace that we may turn from our sins. Share your grace with others that they too may turn to a more holy life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of Jesus, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, I invite you to share concerns and celebrations to bring to God in prayer. Um, on the back of our bulletin, we have some uh, prayer requests and joys. The people affected by the massacre in New Zealand, the people of Paris, France during the riots, Jesse, a two and a half year old with heart problems. We continue to keep the family of Captain Joel Barnes in our prayers this month, the injured firefighters and the residents who lost their homes. Lou Batchutler, who is recovering from broken uh, bones again, and the family of Doris. How's Doris doing, Sharon? I guess she's not listening. Oh, excuse me, she died. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. For Sharon's aunt. Um, and Deb is back with us. She's got some broken bones, but she's got a boot on and made it here. It's too cooling because I was taking four hours a day for pain. I don't want to take them too. Good. Good. And little by little, it's getting better. Right? Um, Andrea's knee surgery. Okay. And the United Methodist Church and our country, we keep those in prayers too. And good news, baby Olin is walking? No. Oh, going to walk? He's not walking, but uh, when, when it went into the uh, uh, clinic, uh, he's trying to stand up with, a, with an aid of a ball. Uh -huh. And the doctor said that there was good news that he might possibly in the future walk. Good, that is great. I think that he might be able to speak a few words later on. He's very encouraged. He's having tremendous amount of work to get home. Good, good. So he, he may be able to walk and maybe talk, even say a few words. Well, that will make them so much easier. But we'll keep him in our prayers. And Jared is doing better too. Jared is home, yes. Yes. And we've seen first signs of spring. Someone saw that last week, I guess. And I've heard Robin singing too. Are there other concerns or joys this morning? I would like to keep the people of Mozambique and, and uh, all the parts of our own country that have been flooded. And, Pray that we can maybe help them with UMCOR gifts to UMCOR. I'm very glad to be here after uh, after a few weeks. Okay. Other concerns or celebrations? I'd like to put Gloria and Carl on the list. Gloria and Carl? Is Carl with a C or a K? With a C. Ship that, that guy wanted to see the video. People 
Um, well, I, I did see that. I did get a heard a comment about that. The cruise ship. I'm not sure exactly what's happening. It's pretty bad. But if you take them off, they said, yeah, rescue them. It's like, well, that's too bad. It's pretty sad. Tugboats that are pulling. Yeah. In the end. Yeah. Last time I saw it, it could be open. Because they could only take 15 people in right. a helicopter. Yeah. Pretty bad, you see it? Yeah. Huh. It's scary. Mm. Mm. Let us turn to God in prayer. <coughs> Lord, we are aware that you know us and you love us. You have called us to be your followers and we, we ask you today to help us to answer that call. Not with lip service only, but with our lives. And with lives that strive to be merciful and compassionate and tender. We pray that we can be forgiving of those who have sinned against us. We pray that the path we follow in our walk with you, we know it won't be easy, but we know it will ultimately lead to life more abundant. Today we give you thanks that Deb's foot is healing so well and that Olin is test results are encouraging. We give you thanks that Jared is home from the hospital and for signs of spring among us. Help us to trust the goodness and the potential for good that you have placed in all of us. We have come to this place to hear your words, to sing and pray to you in hope. And so we pray for healing mercies for Gloria and Carl, for the people on the cruise ship, for those others that we have named aloud in our prayer list. We pray for the family of Sharon's aunt who has passed away and for Dick Hook's family. Oh God, enable us to find the courage to really believe in you that your healing love may permeate our souls and prepare us for true witness. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We will now receive the morning offering. Will the ushers please come forward?